Goes to Calvary, to the crimson flow. Many arrows pierce my soul from without within. But my Lord leads me on, through him I must win. We're singing now, oh, I want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice the cares all past a home at last ever to rejoice when in service for my Lord, dark may be the night, but I'll cling more close to him, and he will give me light. Satan snares may vex the soul, turn my thoughts aside, but my Lord, Goes ahead, leads whatever betide. We're singing now, oh, I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving, of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice the cares all pass home at last ever to rejoice when before me billows rise from the mighty deep then my Lord directs my bark, he doth safely keep. And he leads me gently on through this world below. He's a real friend to me, and oh, I love him so. We're singing now, oh, I want to see him look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving, of his saving grace on the streets of glory. Let me lift my voice, cares all past. Home at last, ever to rejoice. We're singing now, oh, I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice cares all past home at last ever to rejoice good morning midtown say good morning midtown all right, all right. It's very good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Um, at this time, we like to acknowledge our any visitors that we have in the house, any first-time visitors. What we like to do, what we ask you to do, is there should be a visitor's card in the back, in your seat back in front of you. I should ask you to complete that card, and just you can put it in the uh, trays up here when we do collection, or you can put it in the in the suggestion box in the foyer. Um, if you are streaming with us for the first time, we'd like to welcome you. And we also like to um, acknowledge your presence. What you can do is you can go to our website. And our website is coco 
midtown.com, and that's clcomidtown.com under contacts, and um, drop us a line, say first time visitor in the subject, and tell us how you enjoy our service, all right? Thank you very much, and again, welcome to Midtown. Okay, our next election will come from page 437 in our red book, page 437. Page 437, the song is Where Could I Go? And after that, we'll stand and be led in prayer. Page 437, page 437 in our red book. And we'll be singing all three verses. If you have it, let us together sing. Living below in this so sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation sore. Now tell me where could I go but to the Lord? Oh, where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. I'm needing a friend to save me in the end. Now tell me, where could I go but to the Lord? Neighbors are kind, I love them everyone. We get along in sweet accord. But when my soul needs manna from above, now tell me where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Oh, I'm needing a friend to save me in the end. So tell me, where could I go but to the Lord? A life here is grand with friends I love so dear. Comfort I get from God's own word. Yet when I face the chilling hand of death, now tell me where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Yes, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Oh, needing a friend to save me in the end. Now tell me, where could I go but to the Lord? Good morning. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father and our God, we come to you this morning, Father, the best we know. The strength, Father, that you give us, Father, you wake us up to a new day. A day, Father, which, which we do everything in it, pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We thank you, Father, for the privilege we have this morning to come and say, Abba, Father. Amen. We thank you, Father, overall, for everyone, Father, under heaven, Father. Had birth this morning, Father, to give all honor, glory, and praise to you. Yes. We thank you, Father, for 
being here this morning. We are not here on our own merit, Father. You make sure, Father, we have everything, Father, to do your will. You wake us up this morning, you strengthen us that we can come out to use the knowledge and everything you give to us, Father. To know that we are to use it, Father, the way you are intended to. We thank you this morning for our brother Washington. He come with message this morning, Father, that we help in our way, Father, and to bring it out. Father, that we use it every day. Father, not only on Sundays, but on every day we use it, Father. And to go along, Father, live every day for you. Every minute, every hour. We thank you, Father, for our own, our clothing, the food, Father, shoes on our feet, Father, life itself. Father, no one but you. Father, we thank you this morning for all the blessings. In Jesus' holy and divine name, bless the church, say amen. amen. You may be seated. As we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, we're, we, um, we're going to page 135, again in our blue book, page 135, Alas, and did my Savior bleed. Page 135 in our blue book. We're saying verses 1 and 5. Just verses 1 and 5. Alas, and did my Savior believe. In our blue book. Do you have it? Let's together sing. Alas, and did my Savior believe. And did my sovereign die. Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away, rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away, rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Good morning. This part of our service is uh, the communion. Now concerning the Lord's Supper, the Bible tells us in Acts 20 and verse 7, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Also, we find in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, beginning at about verse 23, Paul wrote to the church there. He says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now let us take the, and access the bread and let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to remember you in this way. We pray that as we take this bread, we will remember that you sacrificed your body on the cross for our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, together let us eat. The Bible tells us, started in verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye, as often as ye drink it, and remember of me. Let us pray for the cup. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that your son Jesus came and suffered and died, and he shed his blood on the cross that we might have a right to the tree of life. So we thank you. We pray that you would bless this cup and bless those of us who are partaking of this. In the name of your son Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us access the cup. And together let us drink. Amen. It also says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh in an unworthy manner, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Amen. Amen. Next we will have a collection. Uh, in reference to our collection, the Bible tells us uh, in Second Second Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, it states, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Let us pray for the collection. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to give back a portion of our worldly goods for your use. We thank you and we pray that you would bless us that we might take these funds and use them in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In the name of your son Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Now for those of you who are here you are welcome to come at this time and make your deposits here or if you're at home uh, you can mail it to the Church of Christ of Midtown P.O. Box 585572 Orlando, Florida 32858 uh, If you you also can go to the uh, website and uh, give uh, there Thank you Our next election will come from page 118 in our red book. 118 in our red book. And that song is Shelter in the Time of Storm. We'll sing just the first three verses. Page 118, Shelter in the Time of Storm. If you have it, let's together sing. The Lord's our rock, in him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Don't you know that Jesus is a rock in a weary land? 
a weary land, a weary land. Jesus is a rock in the weary land. He's a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night. A shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes of fright. A shelter in the time of storm. Don't you know that Jesus is a rock in the weary land? A weary land, a weary land. Jesus is a rock in a weary land. He's a shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may around us be a shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat, a shelter in the time of storm. Don't you know that Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Jesus is a rock in a weary land he's a shelter in the time of storm don't you know that jesus is a rock in a weary land a weary land a weary land jesus is a rock in a weary land he's a shelter in the time of storm Okay, our last song before our minister comes forward to break unto us the word is comes from page 348, also in our red book, page 348, Hilltops of Glory. Uh, if you would also mark page 593 in your red book, uh, that will be the invitation song, Free Waters. So 593 is our invitation song, and then the song we will sing, page 348. Hilltops of Glory, I ask that you be standing at this time while we sing this song. And we'll sing all three verses. If you have it, let us together sing. Onward rejoicing, I tread life's way. A higher I'm climbing each passing day. A hilltops of glory now rise in view, where all shall be made new. We're singing hilltops of glory, I now can see. Oh brother, oh brother, won't you come go with me safe on the safe on the mountains I soon shall stand, a hilltops of glory land, way down in Egypt, mid burning sand, and Moses had started for Canaan's land, and never turned backward. Always a sin on to the journey's end. We're singing hilltops of glory. I now can see. Oh, brother, oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the safe on the mountain, I soon shall stand. A hilltops of glory land, a footsteps of Jesus before us lead. We tread life's journey, his warnings heed. A evil allurements cannot prevail. I'm on the up. Word trail. We're singing a hilltop of glory. I now can see. Oh, brother, oh, brother, won't you come go with me? 
Safe on the safe on the mountain, I soon shall stand. Hilltops of glory land. We're singing a hilltops of glory. I now can see. Oh, brother, oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the, safe on the mountain, I soon shall stand. The hilltops of glory land. We're singing a hilltop of glory. I now can see. Oh, brother, oh, brother, won't you come go with me? Safe on the, safe on the mountain. Unless I shall be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. This was done lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it should depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you. He said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And because he said that, Paul said, therefore most gladly would I rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasures in my infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. Paul concludes, for when I am weak, then I'm strong. Amen. I don't know about you this morning, but Paul said, when I am weak, he says, then I'm strong. And if you think about that, that, that statement there, it don't make a whole lot of common sense, but it make a whole lot of spiritual and Bible sense. Paul said, when I'm weak... I'm strong. Uh, sometimes in your life we, we get strong. Yeah, you ever wear up on somebody, amen? Uh, you ever get up in somebody's face, amen? Uh, uh, and when you get strong, you get the feeling yourself. And when you get strong, oftentimes in our life, we don't get the outcomes that we desire. Uh, Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Buck up on me one time and see uh, uh, what you get, amen? But Paul says, when I'm weak, I'm strong. How is that, Brother Paul, uh, that when you're weak, when you're strong? How is that, Brother Paul, you have this thorn in your flesh and you're still feeling good about it? How is that, Brother Paul, that you got these things going on in your life and you got on your knees and prayed to God not once, not twice, but three times you prayed? Now, how is it, Brother Paul, that you can hear other people but it seems like God don't hear you? How is it, Brother Paul, that you can be going through something and you can help other people at the same time and it not seem fair? Yet you be all right there. How is it that Paul says, when I'm weak, I'm strong? And the reason he's strong because he's learning to lean on whom gives us our strength. He's learning to invest and draw from the source, not to gain his resources, but to draw from the source. Paul says, your, uh, your grace is sufficient for me. God said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. In other words, when you stop leaning on yourself and learn to lean on me, then things will get better. Better. When you stop depending on yourself and depend on me, then things will tend to work out all right. When you stop depending on your own strength, but allow God's strength to pervade and to fill your life, your soul, your mind, and body, then you can be like Paul. When he's weak, he's strong. And I don't know about you this morning, but being strong in the midst of weakness is an attitude. Uh, it's a choice. Paul says, when I'm weak... I am strong. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm a little weak this morning, but I'm decidedly strong. I stayed up most of the night last night, but I'm decidedly strong. Everything ain't all right in my life, but I'm decidedly strong. Paul said, when I'm weak, I am strong. We ought to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
and lean not onto on to our own understanding. Y'all been by the church house once or twice, amen. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, good to be in the house of God yet one more time. Good to be counted alive and among the saints. Uh, good to see each and every one of y'all on this morning. We're going to ask the church to uh, pray with us. Uh, Joshua's been sick for the last couple of weeks. Uh, had to uh, run into the emergency room last night, so we was up there all night. But he's home now, doing uh, doing better. But y'all keep praying for us and him. Uh, y'all pray for uh, Joshua, Mama. You know how Mama's is when the baby get baby gets sick. She she about to lose a lose a mind, brother uh, brother Melvin, and she get, she get mad at everybody. Then she wanna raise up on me. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Y'all know how that go. Don't act like that. Don't act like that don't happen with y'all. Amen. Amen. But we's going to be all right. Amen. I say so y'all pray for us, particularly for him, uh, that he might be strengthened. And so because uh, I ain't working but off for of two, three hours of sleep, it's not my intention uh, to keep you long. But if y'all going to uh, not get it, if y'all going to get it, I can get out of here and go on back home. Uh, Oh boy, all right. Uh, for all of you who are visiting with us, uh, uh, the preacher, uh, this preacher has an internal, and most preachers, to be honest with you, we have an internal praise manometer. Uh, an internal praise manometer. It measures amen. You see, amen is the only way I know that you understand uh, uh, the lesson. And so there is set, that praise manometer is set at a threshold level, Brother Smith. Uh, and when that level is exceeded, the message uh, will. Uh, uh, be yours, and so if it, if it take all day, uh, when I'm weak, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I'm strong, yeah, and one thing that God blessed me to be able to do is talk, I can, I can talk for 30 minutes by ice cream, amen, uh, so uh, it don't matter, this is what I do on Sundays, church, uh, so it don't matter to me none, and wife ain't here and son here, so I ain't got to rush home, brother Wilson, I think dinner ought to be steaming, the pots ought to be shaking by the time. I get home, you know, I'm like a pal of that, you know, with the steam, old school, the steam coming out, you know, new school, you just, you know, dinner ready when you hear that ping, uh, but old school, the pots, you know, uh, so I'm looking forward to the pots shaking, hey, amen, y'all stand, y'all stand on your feet, stand on your feet before y'all run me out of here, uh, take your Bible, hold it up in the air, hold it up in the air and repeat after me, repeat after, repeat after me. Uh, Tay, will you do me a favor? When you're done, uh, uh, send CJ in my office, grab my water bottle. Uh, repeat after me. When I'm in worship, I read my Bible. Because I don't want no preacher. Lie to me. Amen, amen, and amen. Take your Bibles, your personal copies of the pages of inspiration, and turn it over to the book of Revelations. Book of Revelations, the chapter is number two. We'll begin reading at verse number 18 and conclude our reading at verse number 22. The book of Revelations, chapter is 2. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. If you have a reliable translation, uh, it should not differ significantly. The book of Revelations, chapter 2. Verse number 18, all that have it, confirm it by saying amen. 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 And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has, hold up, just stay right there. Uh, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame, and his feet like fine brass. He says, I know your works, your love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last, hold on, hold on. And as for the works, the last are more than the first. But nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idol. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent 
of their deeds. I read for you the book of Revelations, chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. Let all those who agree and believe that the Bible is the word of God say amen. amen. You may have your seats at this time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Amen. I was given a responsibility for a new department in the day job not so long ago. The task that was assigned was to write the ship, uh, clean up some things that have been messy for a little while, clear the backlog and get the troops back on the right track. Uh, and as I considered it, it was a significant challenge. Uh, but I was confident that we could get the job done. You know, so I began to look around, and through observance and job shadowing, I found that the members of the group are mostly competent. They are passionate about the work and for serving people, which is necessarily in pharmacy. They want to do the right thing. They want to do the right thing in the right way. They want to make a difference in the workplace and provide excellent service for the patients who are within our care. Uh, committed folks like this make leading a little bit easier. You can get a lot done with people that are willing to work. People who are willing to put their shoulder to the grindstone willing to do what it takes to be successful. That passion made my job a little bit easier. Despite the added workload, I was optimistic about the road ahead. But you know, you can't let your optimism get too ahead of you, you know? I had to remain level-headed about the task at hand. Things were a mess. I was going to be a tough road if everything uh, had been fine, I wouldn't have been asked for that opportunity. Uh, many of you, no doubt, are wondering, well, what was the issue? There was a good team who was not afraid of hard work, and having the right people on the bus, as they say, is half the problem. If you got the right people, uh, you ought to be d able to do some things. And if that's what you're thinking, you're right. Getting the right people on the bus is half the problem. The issue is that it is only half the problem. The other key components involve getting those right people who are already on the bus into the right seats. And once they're in the right seats, the bus uh, needs to head in the right direction. You see, you'll never get to Tallahassee from here going south on I-75. You'll never get to Miami from here going north on I-95. I-4 East will never get you to Tampa. And if you have the wrong driver, you'll likely wreck the bus no matter what direction you decide to take. Uh, what was broken on that team was leadership. Their principal sin was they refused to hold themselves and other people accountable. Like all walks of life, accountability structures in the workplace are very important. We've got to let know, people know what when, why, and how they're to do their jobs. And after adequate training, we have to release them to do it. They don't have to execute perfectly, but they have to do, they have to work at it and keep themselves moving in a positive direction. But what happened to this team and what happens to us in many walks of our life was that folks were conditioned to doing their job sloppily. Folks were used to doing things in the wrong way. And what made it worse is that the leaders should have been aware of the problem, but uh, it's almost as if they looked the other way. When faced with wrongdoing, someone has to say something about it. When you identify errors, you cannot hold still. When you notice things are out of sort, you need to speak up. When you determine things are going wrong, you need to tell somebody. It's not okay to act like everything is okay to make a difference in this world, in this life, on our jobs, in our homes, and in our school, we've got to speak up. 
in all walks of life, we're in desperate need of a culture of, account of accountability. Things only get worse when we pretend that problems don't exist. We must stop looking the other way. The trouble is that we live in a world where no one really wants to speak up. We live in a world where everybody is offended and where everyone avoids conflict. We live in a society where the unwritten and even written rule is don't ruffle anybody's feathers. Don't cause any conflict. Learn to get along no matter what the cost. But I came by the church house to let you know that somebody, and by somebody I mean us, we ought to speak up. When things are going wrong, somebody, meaning us, ought to say something. When trouble is brewing, someone has to be willing to open up their mouths. Somebody must be willing to speak out about injustice. Somebody has to be willing to speak out about unfairness and inequality. Far too long, we as a people of God have learned to keep silent. Far too long we as a people of God have remained quiet. Far too long we have left well enough alone. We've got to learn to speak up in a positive manner. We must stop looking the other way. I came by the church house to tell you that we as a people of God, we've learned to ignore problems in our lives, in our church, in our homes, in our school, in our workplaces. We must stop looking the other way. And I know we live in a world that's ultra Offended. And, and I know I'm going to step on somebody's toe, but we live in a world where everybody is offended by something. Everybody is bothered by something. Everybody has an issue. I even seen people have issues on behalf of other people. I've seen people observe stuff and say, you ought not do that to them. And I said to them, it's not your business to be offended on behalf of somebody else. We live in a world where everybody is bothered, everybody is troubled, and nobody wants to say something. And if you say something about something that you know is wrong, you get labeled as a troublemaker. You get labeled as a somebody that stirs things up. You get labeled as a problem child. But I came by the church house to let you know that our Bible is full of problems. Them, children. I came by the church house to let you know that our Bible is full of men who, and women who caused problems, who stood up, that said something about the situation. It's full of men and women who did something about the situation, and chiefly that came from speaking up. Y'all remember Esther? Y'all remember Queen Esther? She was living in the king's palace. Everything was good in her life, but there was something going wrong with God's people. There was something going to happen to God's people. And she was afraid to speak up. But her uncle let her know that says, if you remain quiet, uh, it's going to be a problem. If you keep your mouth shut, uh, uh, God is going to bring about a situation. But you may not come out on the better side of this thing. What am I coming here to tell you? That we as a people of God, we must stop looking the other way. I said we must stop looking the other way. Sometimes in our life, we look at problems and we see the problems. And you know what we do? Because we don't like looking at the problem, we look away. As if ignoring the problem will solve the problem. And some of us, uh, when somebody brings up the problem, we're troubled by the problem um, because we think the problem is them bringing up the problem. <laughs> uh, we think the problem is them bringing up the problem. No, bringing up the problem ain't the problem. Because the issue exists no matter whether you say something or not. Oh, I'm gonna have to get in y'all grill. This, 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 uh, this, this issue exists. I don't know. We've been going through the book of Revelations. We said uh, uh, we're gonna look at it once a, a month uh, 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 throughout this year, maybe a little bit beyond this year, because Revelations is not something we preach from often. But the, the book of Revelations is important to us as a church, particularly these seven letters to the seven churches, right? Uh, John uh, uh, was on the Isle of Patmos, chapter one says. He was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And so he was caught up and he saw some visions. And so the God, Jesus, the, uh, uh, through the Holy Spirit, told him to take uh, uh, what you're seeing and, and write it. And then specifically, I want you to write uh, uh, this letter to the seven churches. And so the last uh, three weeks, so the last four times we've talked about these seven letters, uh, uh, seven messages for the seven churches. And this week is part four. Every, each week, each church had a different situation. Each church had a different problem, per se. Each church had something else going on. Scholars would tell you that the churches represent seven generations, the seven ages in the history of the church. Some would 
for argue that. Some would say this, this these seven uh, examples show how the church, individual churches can be at different times in their life cycle. Uh, uh, but what I'm here to tell you is that he wrote to seven churches and he gave these seven examples and I believe they are helpful for all of us in our lives as a church universally, even as a congregation. The first church he wrote to, uh, y'all remember Ephesus? Ephesus, they had an Ephesian church. They were doing a good job. Uh, but they lost their first love. And the church at Smyrna, they were working real hard, but they were overly persecuted. And the church at Pergamos, they, they had stopped working, and they just wanted to blend in. And the church this week, Thyatira, had a similar problem, is that they would see something that was going on, know that it was wrong, and know it was wrong within their own borders, and they would say nothing. We as a church... I have to stop looking the other way. TJ, uh, my, my platform for as a preacher, my platform as a preacher is that the stuff that works, works. Uh huh? Because God is in charge. Uh, the stuff that works, works. God's principles work in the church, in your home, in your school, on your job, in your relationships, in your Greek organizations, in your civil organization. What works, works. Um, because the whole world sits in his hand. And what he has set in place works no matter what. But the Bible says he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Uh, that, that means he gives us the stuff that we need to be able to live by and to live well. Now, all things that pertain to life and godliness ain't, ain't, ain't a designer bag or, 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 or Gucci slippers. Uh, uh, those things ain't necessarily for life and godliness. Those are just nice things to have. I mean, you reach in your closet and you have to decide what to wear. And I'm talking to the ladies and to the men. Amen. Because uh, uh, some, some of us men are clothes divas too. Amen. Amen. Hey, come on now. You got a pair of Nikes for every t-shirt color in the... Come on now. If they Nikes, they alligators. And, and you got to watch that coordinate with everything. Come on now. We, we all... That, that ain't what God gave us. If you want that, you got to get that yourself. Amen. <laughs> Uh, but he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's why we preach from Revelation. That's why we preach and spend some time in Proverbs. Because if we just learn to live how God would have us to live, yes. life would be better. Yes. And I'm a living testimony because when I try to live the way I wanted to live, uh, when I was running and shooting and, and diving and dipping, you know how they say. Uh, when I was hanging out, uh, uh, brother, where's what the group is? The perp? No, I'm messing with it. Uh, when I was hanging out with folks and doing, a, I, when I was running my life, cause I made a mess of it. Anybody honest? I uh, say that when I was doing my life, and when I was doing me, I was making a mess of me. <sighs> see, we don't really, uh, see. We we got to be honest with folks, uh, and we got to even tell our young people like young people. Yeah, it's fun. Hanging out all night, yeah, it's fun. Doing all that, yeah, it's fun. People, people don't do stuff that's not fun. You know, if hanging out all night, getting drunk, and, and getting high wasn't fun, they wouldn't do it. It's like hitting myself in the, head, in the head with a hammer. It's not fun. How many people you know do it on a regular basis? The problem is not whether it's momentarily pleasurable, the problem is, is that it doesn't lead to joy. And long term, it leads to turmoil. Yes. And that short term pleasure leads to a lifetime of agony. Mm -hmm. How do I know it? You can look at a person and tell whether they lived a rough light or not. Yeah. Mm hmm? Uh huh? Yeah. You can look at their skin, yeah. the way they hold their shoulders, mm -hmm. thing on their face. I, 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 you, you ever know somebody that's been incarcerated for a while? Or not even incarcerated, but institutionalized. What do you mean by that? Uh, uh, whether it be uh, in prison, uh, in a mental institution, uh, even uh, in, in certain organizations. See, you can look at a person and tell if they've been in the military or if they've recently got up. They carry themselves a little bit different. Uh, and when we live a rough life, hmm? when you've always had to look out who's behind you and worry about somebody shanking you with a plastic fork, you walk different. And these short-term things change us. Anybody in here know that you uh, hurting from some stuff you did a long time ago? Come on now. Uh, knees still hurting because you used to drop it like it was. 
Uh, yeah, 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 you bent one time to the left and you tweaked something in your back and you hurt and never. Come on, is it just me? <sighs> Young people, these momentary things hurt us. And what we do sometimes as parents, as uncles and aunts and, 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 and grandparents and cousins and old people, we just look the other way. We don't really say nothing because we want to be the cool aunt or uncle or the uh, cool cousin. And, you know, uh, uh, we don't really say nothing. Or we say something like, well, I understand when I was their age. Uh, I, I don't want to be a hypocrite. That's the wrong thing. Uh, being a hypocrite is not telling them uh, that it's wrong. Uh, uh, being a hypocrite is you, if you would tell them it is wrong and act like you ain't never done it. Right. Huh? Yeah. See, some of us, because we've done something, we think it's wrong to talk to people about do, against doing that same thing. You know, if we stole an apple, we think it's wrong not to tell people to steal because who am I to judge? And that's a false, uh, uh, that, that is a false premise. That's what Satan does. Satan has taught us in this world that to not judge, and we labeled some things that are judging when the Bible really is talking about assessing. Huh? Uh, there's a difference between judging and assessing. Judging literally means to have a verdict, uh, to pronounce somebody guilty. But Jesus said you can tell a tree by the fruit. but we want to look the other way. But what we should be saying is something like, I've been down the road, you've been. I did the stuff you did. You know, I, 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 I've been 15, but you ain't never been 45. And I can tell you some things. And when we talk to people like that, it's a look. We have to stop looking the other way. Brothers, I'm going to pick at us because Father's Day is coming you know, I ain't going to beat us up on Father's Day, so I got to get it in now. You know, far too long, folks, uh, on Mother's Day, we lift up the mothers. On Father's Day, we drop elbows on the dad. You know what I mean? We tell them, man up and do the right thing, and act like they ain't did nothing, right? That's what we do in the church. We beat up, and we celebrate the moms and beat up the dads. I ain't doing that on Father's Day. Amen, amen. amen. That's just not my thing. I'm not doing that. Because uh, being a dad is hard. Y'all, come on, y'all gonna say amen, because I'm telling you, I'm running on fumes right now. Uh, and being a dad is hard. This is not as off the mess, but I'm gonna be done with Revelation in a second. But being a dad is hard. You know why? Because society says the stuff, being an alpha male is wrong. Being an alpha male is sexist. Uh, 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 being an alpha male is, is old fashioned, it's outdated. It's as if being a man. You're called to be makes a woman less than who she's called to be. These are not mutually exclusive things. You can be the man you're called to be in the presence of a woman who's called to be, who, be who she's called to be. Amen. And if you're both operating on point, there's no conflict. Yes. See, we got a broken mentality. We think, you know, uh, uh, we're going to uh, uh, go half and be together, you know, uh, uh, no, no, a half and half do not make a whole in a relationship. It needs to be a whole person meeting another whole person, and God puts them together. It says the twain become one flesh. He didn't say the two halves become one. Okay, okay but where was I going with that? Yeah, yeah, that, so, so, but guys, I gotta, I gotta, I, I gotta beat up on us sometime. So I'm doing it today, pre-Father's Day. All too often, guys, and I know the ladies do it, but I just know about what the guys do, TJ, because I ain't, I ain't in the ladies' meetings. Right? And so as guys, sometimes we don't like to say nothing. Hmm? Well, let me, let me back up. Let me just be really transparent. Okay? In my profession as a preacher, there's some preachers who ain't no good. And I ain't talking about they don't preach well, and I'm not saying they don't hand the Bible well, although there are some. There are some who are garden tools. Oh, y'all, come on, man, say amen. Do I need to put the names on? I'm not doing that. But what sometimes happens 
in the brotherhood, right. we ignore it. We look the other way. And even our, in the sisterhood, in the entire brotherhood, not just among preachers, have you ever been in a congregation where the preacher ain't no good in that way? And everybody act like it's not a... Yeah, see, we either one or two things happen, Brother Glover. God messed up one time, they try to kill him, right? Or he's a pattern habitual offender, and they ignore it. We as brothers... You know, I am. TJ is a pretty good guy, but I, if TJ, you mess up, I got to say, man, T, man, I don't know what you're going through, what making you, but man, you know, we commit to do this thing with God, man. I know I get like that too. You know, I got to be able to talk, brother, brother Glover, and say, man, you know, uh, Glover, man, you know, I know you want to go upside our head and do like sometime, but you can't do it. And I'm just picking out, they, they happy couple, they sit close together, they. They touch each other. I can pick at them. You know, sometimes you want to, you know what I mean? Yeah. And what we hate, can't do is look the other way. I tell all the brothers, man, if something go down, I got you. I got 500 on reserve post bail. Now, that's a post bail. That means you need to show up. So I get my five. Uh, and that's the limit. I ain't doing no felony stuff, right? But if it's for domestic violence, I can't help you. Because I want to not. <laughs> we can't help you. No matter how much. Y'all looking at me crazy. See, the sin ain't doing it. I mean, sin ain't thinking it is doing it. At least in terms of man. They don't take you to jail for thinking about trying to kill somebody. Because uh, all of us would be in jail. Amen. Some of us would have went to jail on the way to church. <laughs> You know, we said we want to kill strangers. You know, they cut us off in the um, they cut us off on the freeway. Man, I, in our mind, we wishing they get hit by somebody. Huh? But we gotta stop. We have to stop looking the other way because it, it's God condemns this action. Okay, and I'm gonna show you to you in this text. Looking the other way, y'all know what these monkeys? Y'all seen that? See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. That's how we are sometimes. We don't want to say nothing. We act like we don't see nothing. And we act like we don't hear nothing unless it's salacious gossip. Amen. But you can't unsee some things. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And once you become aware, you become culpable. Yeah. You may not have created the problem, but now you are part of the problem. Yeah. How we say it, you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. There ain't no sitting on the fence. Oh, I can't wait till we get to that one there. He says, I wish that you were high or the lay out of sea in church. <sighs> yeah, we're going to have to require everybody to be here present and lock the door when they come in. Uh, looking the other way. John writes these letters. This is the fourth church he wrote to. I told you about Ephesus. I told you about Smyrna. I told you about Pergamos. And so this week, uh, Thyatira. And all these churches were in a similar region. And, and Thyatira was, uh, I like every congregation there. They're, they're unique in several different ways. But Thyatira as a city was, was unique in that it was the home of many guilds. What do you mean? Like the uh, uh, dyers guild, the pottery makers guild, the tent makers guild. You know, the unions. It was a union town. Jimmy Hoffa would have lived in Thyatira, you know what I mean, for contemporary, contemporary. This was a union town. It was full of various trade uh, unions, and they, that's where they organize, and they set uh, uh, some parameters for their trade. That's, that's just like Central Florida is becoming uh, a tech hub and also becoming a medical hub, which is why they built the medical city. And so this was a union union town. If you have to think about something, think about some of these old cities up north, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, you know, with a steel town. They were a union Place. And so it's a thriving city, a virus city, but it's a union. They had guilds, uh, they had people, they were organized. And it says, so to the angel of the church in Thyatira, he says, right, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flaming fire and his feet like fine brass. And I know some of y'all are excited. It's like, yeah, his feet like fine brass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I knew Jesus was black. That's what y'all think. That ain't what he's saying. <laughs> that ain't what he's saying. Uh, I, know, I know. I hate to hurt somebody's feelings, but that ain't what he's saying. Uh, uh, what, this, this is pushing it back to chapter 1. 
And so that's so you know who's talking. Who's the son of God in chapter 1? He's the son of God, the son of man, the one who was dead and now is alive again. They're all the same person. And every time you see his feet were like sound, f- fine brass, refined. His feet were pure. His walk was perfected. Now see that? Uh, he says, I know your works. He says, I know your love. I know your service. I know your faith. And I know your patience. Oh, that's a lot to know about somebody. He says, I know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I know that you care. I know you've given uh, uh, more uh, uh, than you have, than you serve. I know you hold on to your faith. And I know that you work with people. Uh, uh, That's patience. Amen. Uh, Amen. He's talking to the church of Thyatira. He showed up there talking to DZ. Amen. Uh, he might have said, I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, but you need to work on. <laughs> Amen. Amen. T.J., why you say that like that? <sighs> these, th- these are significant things. So don't think when he's writing to these churches, they're totally messed up. Why is that important? Because sometimes we look at the Bible, and I love this about the Bible. The Bible is really transparent. It tells us uh, uh, the good and the bad with people. Yes, it does. David, good and bad. Abraham, good and bad. All his sons, his grandsons, the good and the bad. He gives them the good and bad. That's how I know the Bible is real, because he gives us the good and the bad about people. Nobody is perfect. And so he says, man, this church is doing a lot of things, and on top of that, they're going. How do you know? He says, and I know as for your works, the last are more than the first. What does that mean? You're growing spiritually because you're doing more than what you've done before. We as a church sometimes, we do the opposite. The longer we've been in Christ, the less we do. It should not be that way. He says, instead of waning, you're waxing. Instead of doing less, you're doing more. He says, I know what you're doing, and it's looking good for the most part. But, that's where that nevertheless comes in. He says, but I have a few things against you. Nobody is perfect. We won't always get positive reinforcement. Uh, every year on a day job, and you guys, I know several of you retired, but you remember this, and those of you actively work, work, working know this. Uh, uh, every year, at least, they give you this evaluation, right? Amen. Yeah, and you don't really care if they give you the evaluation. You just want to get your raise, amen. It's yeah. truth be told. But part of getting a raise is getting the evaluation. Right, right. They often go hand in hand. And, and they, they have these categories, and they rate you, right? One to three, one to five, one to ten, they score you, right? Take, and they say, well, you're good at this, you're good at this. But then this other thing over here, uh, and they, they have to be careful how they tell you. Uh, 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 Sister, Sister Tony, they, they tell you stuff. They tell you all the good, then they, they have to be careful about how they tell you the stuff you're not so good at. All right? Because, you, you know, nobody wants to hear that. Huh? Oh, you're good at this and good at that, and then, but this thing right here, they say something like, well, we need you to improve your work. We need you to come to work every day that you schedule. You know what I mean? We need, and then when you're here, when you do come, we want you to be on time. You know, well, I do good work when I'm here, but we need you to, it's called schedule adherence. <laughs> we need you to actually show up when you say you're going to show up. Well, well, y'all don't want to give me no projects, and y'all don't want to give me no promotion. Well, if you just be here every day, <laughs> that's your schedule to be here. And so well, what happens is nobody wants to hear the bad stuff. Hmm? All we want to hear is the good stuff. Well, brother man, sister girl, honey child, nobody is perfect. Amen. And we all got to work on something. Look at this list, man, of this church. He says, man, I know your works, your love, your service. Sometimes we do the right thing, but we do it for the wrong reasons, right? He said they're doing some things, and they're doing it for the right reasons. They love, and then they said they don't, they put themselves beneath. They serve, right? They serve, and then they have faith. Uh, some of us, we just got faith. We believe in God and don't, don't work, don't serve. 
And sure enough, don't love nobody, but yet we say we love Jesus. And he says, and your patience. And that's a lot. But they still have some stuff. What do they have? He says, I have a few things against you. Because you allow. Uh-oh. You allow. So ain't what you're doing is when you letting slide. Hmm? Y'all see that? He says, what you're doing ain't the issue. It's what you're letting slide. Uh, I, my mentor taught me a long time ago, it's not necessarily what you do. It's what you emphasize. And sometimes we just let stuff slide. Huh? Anybody let stuff slide with their kids for too long? You let it slide for too long, and then it's a problem. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a problem. Like, I, I, it's like, I uh, call me, Tay, Tay, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, don't, I just don't let them talk. The kids, I, I've learned to let them talk more. Uh, but when I came up, you ain't say nothing. You just, you just kind of quiet and say, you know, and so, uh, what happened? And so I know I got it way to, you know how we do with the scales. Uh, mine is out of tilt. But, uh, you know, sometimes I've seen uh, women in my life they discuss with the kids. Uh, and then when, when they're angry and they've gone too far, then they want them to hush and not say nothing. Huh? And they wonder why they talking back. Now, I've, said, I've got in a situation sometime and be like, hush your mouth. Listen to your mom. I mean your auntie. <laughs> And I'm too strong. But when you get tense, that's how I tell people all the time. I, I, I have supervisors on the job. They let stuff slide. They let it slide. And then when they get frustrated, they want to ride them up, one right up, five. Well, how you find real? Oh, for the last six months, well, where's the, huh? Where's the, where's the doc? Thank you, TJ. Where's the documentation? Where's the stuff? Well, I talked to them. Well, show me. They allowed it to happen, and now we're dealing with a problem. That's why sometimes we struggle in our relationship, because we allow it to happen, romantic relationships. You know, some people, you know, as a preacher, it gets hard sometimes, you know, and you deal with stuff on both sides of the issue, because we like to paint men and women with broad strokes. No, you deal with stuff on both sides of the issue. And, and you, you'd be dealing with a couple, a brother Smith, and, and the issue that they complain about it's not a new issue. It's almost never a new issue. They, uh, particularly with newlyweds, they thought that just crossing the threshold, when they jumped over the broom, that all that stuff that they did was going to stop. Huh? He was hanging at the 7-Eleven all the time you dated him. Now he wanted to go get a regular job. Huh? Huh? Uh, you see these numbers in his cell phone. And every name in with Isha. Taisha, Kwaisha, Maisha. Huh? And you think when you step over into the, she was sister rocking you when you was dating. Cuss you out at the baby face concert. And you think now, because you're married, <laughs> if she got up in your face, I tell you all the young men, if she get up in your face now, she not going to stop. Because once you're married, what you going to do? You try to get out, the judge say, okay, half. <laughs> we let stuff slide. Y'all getting it? Y'all getting it? Yeah. So it's a problem in life, and it was a problem in the church. He says, you allow that woman Jezebel. And Jezebel, the prophetess, uh, that, the, the real Jezebel had died a long time ago, right? Yeah. Uh, Y'all remember Jezebel, the wife of Ahab? Yeah. Uh, uh, and we give Jezebel a bad name. And the reason why I think we give Jezebel a bad name is because we put stuff on Jezebel that ain't necessarily Jezebel's issue. What are you talking about? If you look in the Bible, Ahab was the king. Yeah. Hmm? She was a foreign princess. Hmm? Her 
father was the king of a foreign land, one of Israel's enemies. First problem is he married her. Second problem is he let her know what she felt like doing. And what was she going to do? Her dad was named after Baal. He was named after the God that they served. Her name is a derivative of the God that they served. When you marry her, she's going to know what she's been doing. Hmm? So when we talk about here, he says, allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. There's some people who call themselves prophets and prophetesses. They ain't. They just call themselves. You know, a guy set up shop, he call himself the Archduke or whatever, and you just believe him. Man, we just believe anything, man. God says, you know, I'm, 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 I'm. he says, what, what they saying now? They apostles. And not apostle with little a, because that word also means messenger. They say the big apostles, like Peter, Paul, they apostles. Now, 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 the qualification according to Acts 1 to be an apostle, you had to be living with Jesus. Because that's when Judas hung himself. They said, we got to pick among the men that were here the whole time. They got all the right teaching. And so unless they're 2,000 years old, but we believe them. We believe them. How we know? Because they... Hit you in the forehead and say, a shoe to shake. <laughs> and I'm, I'm making a joke, but I'm serious. We just let stuff prove. Right. Don't let it slide. Show me. Right. And you ain't got to argue with him. Just show me what the book say. No, I got a revelation. No, what the, re the revelation John wrote say. Yeah. He says he calls herself a prophet. Notice he calls herself. Huh, she made this up. To teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, this is not about sex. Don't get afraid when I say that word, y'all. Sex and money are the two most talked about topics in the Bible. Sex and money. Don't be afraid when I say it. The TV say it all the time. And when they ain't saying it, they're showing it. So when the Bible talks about it, y'all, man, y'all, when I read, when we do, when we preach out a song or something, I mean, oh boy, y'all going, okay. She calls us about, she said, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality. He points to the name Jezebel. Jezebel here is a title for this woman hmm? because it points to the original Jezebel. And what does she do? She tried to seduce God's people away from them. In the Old Testament, uh, being or worshiping in part another God was considered to be immorality or adultery against God. Yeah. Huh? It was considered to be adultery with God. He says, I betroth you to a chaste. I'm a jealous God. Y'all know that text? He says, I betrothed you as a chaste version. The, uh, uh, Christ is the head of church. The husband's the head of white Christ is the head of church. He is the savior of the body. So I had to present himself. The church is the bride of Christ. He says, you got this woman who calls herself a prophetess. He labels her Jezebel to teach and he labels her that because of what the old one did. What's she doing? She teaches and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality, eat things sacrificed to Adam. What is he talking about there? He's talking about their uh, being involved in the local activities. What do you mean, Deezer? Remember I told you that there was a bunch of guilds? Uh, when I told you there was a bunch of, like, unions? And, and part of those unions, they used to meet, where they met was at the houses of worship. Where they met was at these temples to idols. And so when all the carpenters, I'm making up a saying, or the pottery, the pottery guild was big there. When, I, when all the pottery guild got together, they met there. Huh? And what they did, they sacrificed to the pottery god. Hmm? And they would have a festival and eat there. So what is he describing? Uh, he's committing, they're cheating on me. And they eat things sacrificed to idols. In other words, they're just in and among these people. And because it's associated with the guild, this is the point right here, because it's associated with the guild, with the union, there was money tied to it. See, uh, 
If I'm in the union, I heard y'all talk about that this morning. This is how the Holy Spirit works. If I'm in the union, huh? I got to do what the union do. I heard Brother Wilson mention going on strike or something this morning in Bible class. When I'm in the union, we got union ropes, and we walk the line. You know what I mean? We tow the line. And when somebody get out of sorts, it causes a problem. And if you didn't act right or behave right at this particular time, it was a problem. Particularly, it was a money problem for you. See, we, we, all, came, we all in with God until it messes with our pockets. Huh? Let me say that again. We all in with the Lord until it messes with our pockets. Oh, we love the Lord. And then God, the money, God, the money trusts, but not us. He says, you, she seduces my servants to commit sexual and I eat things sacrificed to idol. And he says, look at this. He says, I gave her time to repent. And she didn't repent. God gives us all time. God is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but it's long suffering toward us. I had a friend in the height of COVID. Uh, he says, oh, these I'm telling you, it's the end time. Y'all know people like that. He was passionate about it. He says, Lord, he's coming. He's coming soon. I just know it. And, you know, um, and I would say something to him. I said, I sure hope not. He said, these are He bleed in the rapture. He's like, man, we're going to be called up. And he said, oh, Lord's coming back. He's going. I said, I sure hope not. I said, and he said, well, where do you get that from, preacher? You know how they talk to you. You know, you some kind of preacher. God is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slack, but is long suffering toward us, not willing to end in prayer. I was hoping not to give more people time. I don't know when God's coming. But I know a person dies every six seconds in this world. So in the time that I've been giving this message, this call is 40-something minutes, and it's time. Huh? 400 people have died. How many of them think named Christ? How many of them you think? I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. I gave her time to do right. She didn't do it. That's a hint to us. When we see wrong, we got to approach it. But you can't be overly, you know. You do need to give people some time. We just can't sit there and just look the other way, pretending stuff not happening. Watch this. He says, indeed, watch this, for truth, verily, verily. That's what he's saying. I will cast her into a sickbed. In other words, he's going to cripple her, break her down. I, I see firsthand. How this work? That's the worst thing. He said, I'm going to punish her the very worst way I can make. I'm going to make her an invalid. She ain't going to be able to get up out of bed. Anybody been sick for a while? Amen. Well, and when you've been sick for a while, you laid up in the bed, that bed becomes a prison. Yes. He said, I will cast her into a sick bed. Huh? It's, it's, it's three groups that he deals with. He says, one, I'm going to deal with her. Watch the text. He says, I'll cast her into a sick bed. And then those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I gave her a chance, I'm going to give them a chance. But I'm going to her, cast her into a sick bed, right? And then he says, I'm going, the people that's following her, and there's two forms of the people that's following her. And the, he said, the first are the followers, those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. I'm going to send problems their way. Sometimes a problem gets sent out of the way, it ain't the devil. Yeah, 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 yeah. You missing church trying to get somewhere else and you get a tie flat. That ain't the devil. You work all that overtime, take away time from your family and from the church, and then you wonder why your uh, transmission go out. That ain't. I will kill her children with death. And all the churches, huh, shall know that I am he who searches mind and heart. He says, I'm going to get her. I'm going to get her followers. And he says, I'm going to kill her children. In other words, the people who now teach this stuff. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So there's two types of followers. There's the passive followers and the people that teach that stuff. You know, I mean, every group there is like that. You know what I mean? There's a guy that leads people wrong. There's the people who just follow it. And then there's people who propagate the message. 
And then there's a fourth set of people. And if you run past it, you'll miss it. He says, I will kill her children to death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, right? I see what they're thinking, and I know where their passion is leading them. He says, and I will give to each one of Y'all see that? If you run past it too fast, you'll miss it. He says, I will give to each one of you according to your works. It's Jezebel, her passive followers, her active followers, and it's us. Who is the us? It's the people in the previous verses who tolerated her, who sat by and said nothing. How long are we going to say nothing about what's wrong? Did you cover or sore, huh? Mama said get infected. That's why when we was young, they didn't put band-aids on everything. They just let it breathe. Let some air get to them. I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest is in Thyatira, as many have not do not have this doctrine who have not known the depths of Satan as they say, I will put on you no other burden. He said, for the us that's doing right, kept their head going straight, he said, ain't going to ask you to do too much. But the ones y'all just looking the other way, hold fast. Hold on. He ends this section just like he is the prior three sections. He says, he that has an ear, let him hear. The Spirit says, to the churches. Do we have the mind of God? When he says he that has an ear, it's, it's the equivalent of being tuned to the right frequency. Hmm? Right now, there are millions of signals crossing through us, in us, in and out of this building. Hmm? There's 30 people in here, there's 30 cell phones, at least 32, because some of us got work. It's iPads, you know? TV still, you could still put buddy ears out, right? And get some TV, believe it or not. You don't have to pay for cable. Those signals are coming through us. Radio stations are coming through us. China listening. <laughs> All the signals, the government, NSA, whatever. That's the Wi-Fi signal. But we don't hear it. Because we're not tuned to that frequency. I know we listen to satellite radio, but it, go turn it on FM, AM. To get what's going on on a certain channel, you got to tune in to that channel. And if you're not turning it into the channel, you won't hear nothing. And if you're tuned in just a little bit off, the message gets distorted. Yeah. Hmm? He says, he who has an ear. God is talking. Is anybody listening? Are we tuned in to the things of God? Or are we like this people? Who because of what we got going on in his life, I don't want to make a ruckus. You know, the rest of the coppersmiths, we about to go down here and do this thing and if I mess up, I make a ruckus, I'm just, just kind of go down there. I'm going to do everything they do. Just fit in. And when the wrong is happening, I'm going to look the other way. That's not a blessed state. That's not a desired state of existence for us. God wants us to stand up for what's right. We keep looking to the government to do the job that the church is called to do. Yeah, let me say that again. We keep looking to the government to do the job the church is called to do. You know, sometimes, well, why don't they date? And we wonder, well, God, why won't you, and why won't they, the government, do? And I think sometimes God's looking at us, it's like, no, I sent you to do these things. Feeding the hungry, that ain't the government's job. That's the church. 
taking care of the needy. That's not the government's job. It's the church. We look at everybody else. And what we really need to be looking at is ourselves. Are we listening to what God is saying? The principle this morning is that we have to stop looking the other way. Now, that works two ways. It works in your environment. Hmm? It also works. Nigga, it work on me, too. Huh? Some of the stuff so the that I do, I got to stop overlooking. Huh? You got to be honest with yourself. And then you got to be honest with other people as well. Paul writes in Ephesians, it's Ephesians 4, 15. Y'all know the, know the verse, but the preceding verses let us know to be mature and to grow as Christians, we have to speak the truth in love. Huh? We have to stop looking the other way. And to say that because some of us, we like to keep it real, Right? And what that really means is callous, unthoughtful, inconsiderate. And what it really means is ineffective. Paul says, speak the truth in love. You can tell me a lot of things once I know that you care. You can tell me a lot of things. It just depends on how you say it. I can go to Brother Sutton and say, man, you staying nigga crazy. And see, he just laugh. I just call him crazy. We have to stop looking the other way in our lives, in the church, in our homes, especially concerning our soul's salvation. There's some of us who ain't named God. We just kind of just slid into church. You know, people like that. Uh, It's just me if they grew up in the church and they just kind of go and come and they never really identify Christ. Christ said, if you deny me from before me and him, will I also deny before my Father in heaven? But if you confess me before me and him, will I also confess before my Father in heaven? You can't slide in. You have to affirm. You have to affirm. How do you do that? You affirm what you have heard and believe. Jesus Christ is son of God. But Brother Washington, I ain't sure. That's why it's called faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things. At the very basis, faith is a choice. Hmm? It's like any other thing in my life. I'm presented with certain proof, certain message that I have to choose. You have to choose Christ. We believe in everything else. Our lives are a faith system. You know, we get in the car, that was faith system. We go home to how the, everything works in that. That's faith. You know, I don't believe in that spiritual, religious stuff, it seemed like, ugh. There's some of you right now can look on your cell phone and see what's in your refrigerator. It's got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. My dryer will tell the manufacturer when it's broken. Now that seemed mystical. If the machine can do it, create uh, or communicate with his creator in a way that's not visible. That's a different message for a different day. Confess what you believe. Be baptized. Not outward short of inward grace is the answer of a good conscience toward God is that which now also saves us. It's not just some act that you do once you've been saved. It's a thing that gets you saved. And then you have to live faithfully. Just a few verses prior to our text. Uh, Live thou faithfully unto death. And I will give you a crown of righteousness. The context of faithfulness in Revelations 2 and 10 was enduring under persecution. Hmm? They did their very best in spite of what was happening in their lives. And that's our job. And that's my desire for myself and for all of us. That we continue working with God. We continue walking the path in order that we make heaven our home. I don't know where you are, but I invite you to respond as together we stand and as together we sing. There's a fountain free, free just for you and me. me. 
Let's pray. Kind and merciful Father, Lord, Lord, King of Kings, we thank you, O oh God, for this day. We thank you indeed for your blessings. Uh, those of life, health, and strength, those of right mind. Uh, Father, we thank you for just allowing us to come together, draw together at this appointed hour to worship you. Father, we pray uh, that the word uh, resonates in our heart, that it finds rich soil, uh, that it's seeded and grows and bring forth fruit unto you. Father, help us to be the people you would have us to be, the children that you would have us to be, the salt of the earth, the light of this world. Father, we'll be with those who are struggling this morning, those who are sick, shut in. Uh, be with my son, Joshua. Bless him, bless his body, and ask that you grant him healing. Father, we also ask for a measure of peace and comfort for those who are experiencing loss. We also ask for a particular prayer for the Dixon and Walker families who uh, we'll be traveling in, to this area uh, this coming week to uh, memorialize uh, their matriarch, matriarch, your daughter, Sister Johnny Mae Dix. Father, we just ask that you watch over us, bless us, guide us, keep us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. We thank you so much uh, for your presence and your attention on this morning. Uh, we'll be standing as we're led in a verse of a song as we close out in prayer. Troublesome times, times are here, filling men's hearts right with fear. Freedom we all did, now is that state. Humbling your heart to God, saves from chastening rot. Seek the way pilgrims trot, Christians away. Jesus has come. Coming soon, morning or night or noon, many will meet their doom. Trumpets will surely sound, all of the dead shall rise. Black from the shining skies, with the way pilgrims from Christians away. Would please be bowed with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time with bowed heads and humble hearts, Father God, in reverence to you, giving you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. We thank you for blessing us with life, health, and strength, Father God. We thank you for blessing us to be here to receive the message this morning. We thank you for allowing us, Father God, to be able to uh, learn and, and be edified by your word, Father God. We thank you for Brother, uh, Brother Washington, our preacher. Uh, we thank you for his uh, diligence. We thank you for his uh, studies. We thank you for him being present, Father God. Thank you for his service. Uh, we ask and pray that you bless him to know that we greatly appreciate all that he does. Uh, we ask and pray that uh, you continue to be with us throughout this week, Father God. Uh, place a shield of protection around us, uh, protecting us from any hurt, harm, or danger. Uh, and we ask and pray that you can keep uh, continue to keep us safe until we meet here at the next present time. Uh, we ask and pray. Uh, to be, be with those who are sick and shut in, Father God. Please continue to be with Joshua. Bless him, Father God. Touch him. Place your hands upon him and bless him with a clean bill of health as soon as possible. Um, as we get ready to depart from your, your place of worship, Father God, we ask and pray that you bless us with traveling grace to get to our next destination. And all these things we ask and pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 